Hi guys, I'm Andrew. And I'm Angela. And this is the Musicians Toolbox Podcast. Here on this podcast, we interview musicians to see what tips and tricks they would give us to be successful in the music industry. And today we've got a very special episode with Aaron Miller. Yes, Aaron Miller is professor of bass and also the head of jazz studies at Brigham Young University, Idaho. And um, before he was a professor, he also toured as a musician with the Glenn Miller Band, and he's played with a lot of really, really amazing, famous jazz musicians that you've probably heard the name of, but me as a classical musician, <laughs> I don't remember them very well. I, I think I remember one of the one of the people you telling me that you played with was Joe Lovano. Did I get that right? Yes. Among many, many others. So we are so honored to have you here with us today. Um, Aaron, thank you so much for making the time. My pleasure. Thanks for awesome. having me. <laughs> so our first question for you, um, because obviously not everyone knows who you are, can you tell us a little bit about your history and how you came to become a musician? Sure. So uh, you two probably know a little more about my history, but, uh, <laughs> but um, I grew up in Twin Falls, um, Idaho, and um, my mom uh, is still a piano teacher. and so. Every morning waking up, my my, uh, my room was directly below the piano. So every morning <laughs> I would wake up to hearing um, my mother's students run scales. And typically at the 5.30 and 6 o'clock hours, those were students that were in high school and they were typically more proficient. And so I was hearing a lot of scales every morning and all these routines and things like that. Um, and uh, I don't know that I ever had a choice to not go into music. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was just... There was an assumption that we were going to play the piano, and that's that's where everybody in our family started. Um, and then uh, when I was in fifth grade, I knew that I wanted to play the bass. Um, and I, I wanted to play the bass really badly. We started orchestra that year, and I went to go sign out the bass, and somebody else had beat me to it. <gasps> Who was uh, taller? Who was taller than I was? Yeah. <laughs> so the uh, Mr. Sweet, the uh, the orchestra teacher, informed me that uh, I needed to play cello, and I I did. It was fine. It never it never really like captured my imagination like the bass did. I've always listened to music from the bottom up, and um, so that year, uh, about three weeks before the orchestra concert. Um, our bassist quit and he stopped coming to class and oh I said gosh. oh man this is my this is my chance so <laughs> I said to Mr. Sweet I said hey can I play bass on the concert and he said well it's really soon he goes you can try but if you don't learn how to play the bass by then if you can't play the parts you're gonna have to play cello which I actually took as a threat and a challenge <laughs> and, so, and so I uh uh, you know, uh, those of you that are familiar with Twin Falls, I would I would take this bass, which was it's always been bigger than me, it's always been taller than me, and I'd walk down to my grandfather's <laughs> law office, and I'd take it home every day after school so I could practice. Uh, and uh, how far of a walk was that? Just so people know, <laughs> you'd, have to, you'd have to look it up on maps. I I don't want from the high school, right? No, from no, Bickle Elementary. Grade. From Bickle, it had to have been about a mile at least. I, I I'm not sure. Yeah, it would. I mean, yeah, yeah so. mile and a half. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't want to sound like I was walking home uphill and uphill every ways. day. Cause <laughs> but but it was it was definitely a, a a real experience for me. And again, it was I was so hungry to play that instrument. Like that was that was the one I wanted to do. That's the one I wanted to play, and um, I was I was highly motivated. So ever since then, that's that's been the instrument I played. Um, I got exposed to uh, playing in jazz groups um, between sixth and seventh grade. Um, my mom signed me up for a an improvisation class that was offered during summer session uh, mm -hmm. through the community college there in, in Twin Falls, and and so I took that and immediately started playing gigs with the older musicians <laughs> that were there. And so, um, wow. So that was, it, it just, it, it made sense to me. Uh, I took to it real quickly. Uh, that was also the same summer that I was given an electric bass. And um, and so the, the thing for me is I never had a teacher on the bass growing up. And so I had to um, kind of learn on my own. When I got the electric bass, 
I took a couple lessons from a bassist who now actually plays in the Seattle Symphony. His name is Joe Kaufman. Mm -hmm. And um, I took a few lessons with him on electric bass. Uh, never really had much on upright bass. I think um, I think my mom took me to Boise a couple times to take bass lessons from a cellist. So that was, <laughs> that was really that was really it. And and that actually speaks more to kind of the the lack of um, quality teachers there are on the string bass in Idaho, at least especially back in in the late '80s, early '90s. So um, so. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I took to the jazz thing, uh, and so because I didn't study with bass players, I studied with other instrumentalists, and, and that really kind of opened my eyes and my ears to different ways of approaching music, and especially jazz. Um, and so I would learn either by transcription, by listening to recordings, and trying to do what I heard on recordings, uh, and, then, um, and, and, and then just go with it. So I did that up through... Um, all the way through high school and college, and um, I didn't start taking formal lessons until after uh, I got back from Chicago when I served a mission there. So when I got back from Chicago in 2002 is when I first started taking bass lessons. You so, were past your you were in your 20s at that point, right? I was 22 at that point. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wow. Well, and I feel like we just need to clarify one thing. He said something at the beginning how we. Uh, might know his background a little bit better. <laughs> um, we're cousins, so mm -hmm. Aaron and Angela are brother and sister, and we're cousins, so, so I, that just might make sense a little bit go. more. Anyways, there you go. Um, so who are some influential people during your career that led you to be a musician? Obviously, like during Mr. Sweet was. He, yeah, during my youth. Yeah, during my <laughs> youth, uh, actually, there was a really great band teacher and orchestra teacher you know, in Twin Falls that, that I really looked up to. Uh, Mr. Howard teaches the orchestras there, and I always, up until uh, 10th grade, I participated in orchestras, and then at that point, um, I started playing with the Magic Valley Symphony, and so I was playing bass with them instead of an orchestra. Um, and I had, I guess I had other interests where things had shifted a little bit. Mr. Sweet was great, he was a good start. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in music and uh, actually in my junior high years which were really formative for like the jazz thing uh, Mr. Bortz actually taught the jazz band and I I have to admit that I was most likely um, a real difficult student for him but, <laughs> but he but he was really gracious with me and um, very supportive of helping me understand not only like that it's important to do your best as a soloist and as a musician, you know, on your own, but also to be a, a contributing member of the group too. So, um, at, at about that time, I would say probably in about ninth grade, uh, CSI had hired a new, uh, jazz faculty. His name was Jim Mayer and he ran the, the jazz program and, uh, the big band program. And he would, because it's a community college, you would have this mix of, um, kind of an older generation that was doing this for, for fun outside of, outside of uh, their regular lives. They would be playing music. And then they would also bring in people that were at the community college going to school studying music and then high school and junior high students sometimes depending on, it, on who it was. And so I had, I had connections there from clear back when I took that improv class in, seventh, in sixth and seventh grade. Um, and so I started basically playing with college students and, and people who were older uh, at that point. And that was really formative for me. Um, I played a lot of gigs and stuff with Jim. Uh, Jeff Fox was really important too. He, he had put together a group where we would all play together. And, um, and then Gene Loringer, a guitarist out of um, Hagerman, he also was a, was a big mentor for me. I took some lessons directly from him and then uh, you know those type of things and that was all during high school and kind of growing up like getting me started in the music and the thing that I loved about Gene Loringer is that when he would call a tune he wouldn't give me the music for it <laughs> and so he's like oh yeah let's play this one I'm like I don't know that one he's like that's okay and he would always start like these great jazz standards like I remember he taught me um uh, here's that rainy day, and and maybe that's one for your listeners to so go check out that tune. Go listen to, um, 
I believe there's a great recording of Ella singing it somewhere, but you can find lots of great recordings of it. But just go check it out, and and you'll hear there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of harmony going on in it. He called it one time on a gig. He's like, let's play that one. I'm like, I have I I don't know that one, and he's like, well, he played the whole chorus, the whole entire form of the tune as an intro as slow as he could, not slowly, but and he kept showing me. On his on his guitar, he'd just like, okay, here's the bass note, here's the bass note, here's the bass mm. note, and he'd show it real slowly, and then we'd get started, and that was it, <laughs> and that was it, and then if I would miss the form, he'd kind of give me this eye, like, not like mean, <laughs> he'd be like, really, like, and then he'd show it to me again, I'm like, oh yeah, okay, and then he'd, he'd do that for like a bar or two, and then if he could hear that I was back on, then he'd go back to what he was doing, um, and so, you know, going back to that idea of this of of ear training that we had talked about just briefly before it was it was crucial to actually be accepted in this group to have good ears and anticipate where music was going and so that mm -hmm. was something that i had to develop uh, at a pretty young age to be involved in the in the type of music that i wanted to be in so um so that was like the opening chapter and then i would say the post chapter would be post mission um I, uh, I did a lot of playing with, um, oh, sorry. And there was also, uh, of course, Mr. Smack, who was a choir teacher. I played in a, in a pop choir that was really good for me socially and, and made a lot of great friends there. It was fun. So uh, <laughs> anyway, when I got back from Chicago, it took me about two years to figure out that I wanted to do music. And I kept changing my major and changing my major. <laughs> And in that time, um, Brent Jensen had actually come to CSI to replace Jim Mayer while I was gone. And Brent would just call me up. He's like, hey, I got a duo. We should go play this. And so it was always just me and him. Yeah. And, and you know, having two instruments that really, I mean, I can play chords, but I don't really when I'm in this format, not, not really in, in a duo situation. Um, it started opening my ears to having to like think of the bass in a very melodic way to create two melodic lines that kind of work together. So uh, Brent was, was very formative for me. Um, I finished my degree. Uh, I, did, I, I finished a degree at CSI and then went on to, to go on the road, like you mentioned, uh, with the Glenn Miller Orchestra and um, came home in the fall to go to school at Boise State, finished a a Bachelor of Arts there in music, and then did my master's degree at um, University of Colorado at Boulder. And while I was there, um, they were kind of transitioning with their bass teachers at that time in, in the jazz area. And mm -hmm. so for the first year, I studied with a with a bass teacher who was never really kind of there. He kind of and, and he would his his feedback was always like, "Man, that sounds great," and then it was it would move on. And I would I would I got so frustrated that I went in to uh, the director of jazz studies and I said, look, like, I got to take lessons with somebody, like, because this isn't working out. And, and he allowed me to actually take lessons with the classical teacher there. So during my mm -hmm. master's in jazz, I was studying with the classical bass teacher. Um, <laughs> and uh, and that's Paul Earhart. He's still there and he's a fabulous teacher and he was a, a really big mentor for me. And probably the reason why I was able to get the job here at, at BYU-Idaho. Because um, I actually won the job during my first year of my master's degree. Wow! And I had I had to prepare a classical recital with one jazz tune. So if you guys, you know, I I didn't have a lot of I did have repertoire. I mean, I had there were class all the all through my undergrad. It was all classical lessons. I never really had uh, jazz bass lessons per se. Um, so anyway, he. He helped me get ready for it. He taught me a lot of wonderful things that, that were perfect for what I needed. And uh, came, auditioned. I auditioned thinking I wouldn't want the job. <laughs> <laughs> and, and after I got to work with the students, I was like, I would, I would be really disappointed if I wasn't able to do it. So I was real mm -hmm. grateful to, to win it. I finished my master's degree in three semesters. And most wow. students take three years. And so it was a, it was, it was, very focused and very intense. Um, and then I started teaching here at BYU-Idaho in January of 2008. Um, I took a leave from 2012 to 2014. I took a sabbatical and did my doctorate in classical bass performance 
from Northwestern and studied with Andy Rossiti there. And he's a huge, uh, probably my, he, he is my, my mentor on, on the double bass. So, yeah. Yeah. So for, um, I know for some people touring with like the Glenn Miller orchestra or a group like that is kind of like their dream. It's like <laughs> their dream to go and be a musician like that. Sure. So can you tell us what that's like? to have a job sure. like that. Yeah, no, I think I think uh, there was actually a, a saxophonist years back in, in Downbeat that put together this article. They were saying, hey, we're trying to put together these articles from people that are in the field. What would you do? What would, if you were to design a Jazz 101 class, what it would look like, what would it look like? Mm. And, and, and Phil, I, I believe it was Phil Woods, I could be wrong, but I, I believe it was Phil Woods, who's a really fine alto saxophonist, uh, said, well, I would get them I would get all these students, all these jazz majors, get them on a bus, have the windows totally blacked out, uh, <laughs> drive them around for a couple hours, get them off the bus, have them, have them pull out the charts, put the set in order. Um, sorry, my dog just got up. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell that's what that was. <laughs> uh, have, them, have them put their set list in order, have them put on their, their uniform for whatever gig it is, and then have them take it all back off and get back on the bus. He goes, because if, if, if you can survive that part of the job, the music's never hard. Right. Mm -hmm. The music's never hard. It's, uh, as, as, as they say in the jazz community, it's the hang. If you can't, mm -hmm. if you can't handle the hang, then it's not going to work. And so, you know, how, how much chill do you have on those kind of, on those kind of situations? Can you, um, can you put up with a lot of stress or with a lot of, uh, unknowns when you're on the road because you you don't have power or control over any of the situation right like mm -hmm. i was out the entire time i never once got asked where i wanted to stay the night i never once got asked how much i wanted to pay for my hotel while i was out you know uh, i never got asked any of those things it was you show up you do the sound check you pull the you pull the tune list you're usually <laughs> sight reading half of the music that night on the gig and you know you, you put it away and you do the same thing tomorrow. So it's, wow. it's a, uh, yeah, it was, I mean, it was, it was awesome. Like it was a great training experience for me. Um, and I think, you know, in a different, in a different set of circumstances, I probably would have stayed out longer. Um, mm -hmm. but I was, how already, long were you out? I was out for about four months, maybe five months. I started, uh, pretty early in the, in the spring that year. And then I came home, uh, I believe in August is when it was. And so, um, <clears throat> I had, when I, when they asked me to, to tour with them, they'd actually come through Twin Falls earlier that year and Brent and I hosted a jam session for the band. And it, it was like, it was one of the most awkward things I've ever been a part of. <laughs> really? <laughs> because like I would play and all the players would come up and they'd like sit in and they'd want to play and all this stuff. And then I was like, well, I should let the bassist like take a turn. So I, I sat down and everybody sat down nobody wanted to play with him uh, there, wow. was, there was some pretty bad pretty bad vibes going on, on Yikes. so, uh -huh. so yeah. I, I ended up getting a call about two months later and asking if i would go out with the band i said sure and i i could do it and <laughs> uh, within the same week that i got the call for that we found out that Lori was expecting our first child william mm. uh, and and so it you know again it was like the the initial i was supposed to stay out through the end of the year um, because they had a Japan tour in November and December where you go over to Japan and, and that's kind of like the highlight for that band for sure. Right. Um, but no, it was, uh, as, as we were kind of moving along, uh, it, it just was clear that I needed to be home and, and mm -hmm. be with my family. And, and so I came home and it was a good thing too, because I was able to get into my degree and, and, and move forward. I probably would have been a year behind on things. And I think I would have missed some of the opportunities that opened up for me. So did you, uh, just to give us an idea when you're on the road like that touring, um, how do you perform five nights a week, every night of the week? So with that band, uh, they were on tour 50 weeks a year. Oh, wow. Wow. And, um, there were, I would say in an average month, let's say in a month of 30 days, uh, you might have one day that's just a travel day. 
Wow. Well, maybe two, but it just depends on, on how they book things. And then it was frequent. Like there was one time we played uh, it was like two days or three days. It was like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday where we were playing uh, close to four or five sets a night because we were doing a dance. And so they would have, they wow. would have different groups for each, each set. Where they would just rotate people like their their uh, mm -hmm. patrons in. So, so yeah, okay. So okay. that one that was probably the most we played, but we we would do matinees and evening shows, mm -hmm. um, you know those those type of things. Uh, it you know it's 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 pretty it's pretty standard. There was a there was another time when I was in Boise that I played with the producers during their second uh, national tour. So you know that's that. Uh, Mel Mel Brooks musical, you know, mm -hmm. it, yeah, okay. So um, it had not been made into a movie yet at that point, so I wasn't familiar with it when it was coming through. But um, with that one, the you know the week was I, I got a call for it. They said it's going to be seven days, ten services, and so you know we had a, we had multiple matinees and then the evening shows every night and a couple of rehearsals as well. And so that kind of that was nice because I had been off the road for a while and I'd forgotten what that felt like you know. yeah. uh, but that's pretty standard I mean you know if you can if you can get one of those jobs it's great I think um, there's quite a bit of opportunity on cruise ships um, for that type of thing if you want to play and just be playing mm -hmm. I think the other opportunities uh, live in big cities and so all of these things are things that are kind of suspended at this point but yeah <laughs> But, you know, if, if the economy gets back to that kind of normalcy again, and I think people will want it when when it's safe again, uh, to be able to have uh, those kind of social experiences. I think people are kind of starved of it. I think people are pretty right. tired mm -hmm. of watching Netflix every night and having that be their only outlet. So Yeah. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so I asked one of my jazzy friends at school some questions, and this kind of ties into people wanting music and wanting a social life, this question. And so he asked, do you think that classical and jazz music is falling by the wayside? Or do you think um, people want it? Or what do you think about that part of the industry? Well, I, I think he was probably correct in, in acknowledging that jazz music since about the 50s has mm -hmm. been an art music mm -hmm. and, and it distanced itself from being a popular music at that, at that time. So um, there's, there was a statistic that I had heard when I was coming up through school and, and it was like every year it was like, hey, guess how much, guess how much uh, jazz and classical records, how much of the total record sales they, they accounted for in the United <laughs> States. And I don't know if you guys know this. I've never I don't. actually looked that up, but... Okay. But I know when, it's not very much. <laughs> at, this point, at this point, it was 2%. Yeah. And they split it between the two of them. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, yeah, so it's it's not a lot, you know, and they always, there's always this joke of, and I don't want to, like, I'm not I'm not trying to paint a dark picture because I really don't, I don't feel this way at all. But, like, there was this, this other one, too, is this joke of, you know, how do you make a million dollars in, in jazz? Mm -hmm. and, and the answer is you start with two. <laughs> And, 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 but but no there are i when i say all that stuff and then i look back at my life and i'm like but that, that hasn't been my experience yeah right. my experience here's here's my experience and this is what i would give to any student in any style of music okay is that there and this actually it's not even for music this is just life mm -hmm. there is always room for people who are very good at what they do <laughs> and who are passionate about what they do so, you know, if, if you're great at something, you're going to get a job and you're going to be good at it. Like it's, mm. if you're, if you're, if you love what you do and you dedicate, you know, so much of your life to it, you're going to find it. It's going to get there. It might not, it might not happen quickly. Um, I've seen a lot of my friends take a longer path to get to a point where they feel secure with things. But if, if you want it badly enough, you can, you can make it, you can make things happen. And, mm -hmm. and I think the world supports having people who are really good at something like mm -hmm. you really like that. So, yeah, that's that's where I am with that. I don't know if that answered your question. I, yeah, it did. I, I really no, like I, that. Andrew. Yeah. Okay. I think it does. <laughs> yeah. I am. Um, I have a friend who's 
uh, album, he did a solo viola and, you know, accompanied by piano recording in January, and it is now number one in the classical charts in Apple mm -hmm. Music. Great. And I think it has almost 50,000 listens. <laughs> so that just kind of, yeah. like when you said how many, like it just, you know, to be a chart topper in pop music, it's millions and millions, but... Yeah. And yeah. So that's why when you, I was like, it can't be that much. <laughs> I know that that's yeah. how many listens his has had in six months. So. Well, and this, of course, too. I mean, these, these, uh, these things. When I was growing up, this is totally before Napster had even like mm -hmm. come on the scene, let alone iTunes and and Apple Music and things like that. And so, um, digital music was not a thing at that point, and now it is. Mm -hmm. And and so you know, there's a whole there's a whole another conversation somewhere of, of what do you do with you know with with music and I and I think you know you guys are obviously showing like this is an option like there's there's ways to reach your base and your your audience uh, and to create something that people want uh, whether it be through YouTube whether it be through live performances you know that it's I, I feel like you you don't need to there's lots of people that are going to make excuses and make make problems or not problems or make uh, reasons why you shouldn't do something. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be the one to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I like right. that. Yeah, you don't need to make your own. You know. <laughs> yeah. If if you're working hard, it's going to work out. It'll just it might take time, and you have to be mm -hmm. patient with it. Yeah. Um, I I just talked with a friend of mine, Justin Nielsen. He's up in Boise. Uh, we talked to him yesterday, and he was watching this interview of like this fabulous jazz pianist. And they were asking them, hey, what, when, you know, what did it take, like, for you to, like, make it and all this stuff? And he said, well, you know, or, or maybe it wasn't even that. Maybe they were just talking about early in his career or something. I can't remember exactly what it was. But the comment, he's just kind of talking along. He's like, oh, yeah, well, you know, for eight, eight years, I, I you know, eight, I, I moved to New York. And, and for eight years, I, uh, I worked a restaurant job. And then I started gigging. And it was, and then he, and then he started wow. answering like the question in, 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 really specifically, but it was just this kind of like, oh yeah, for eight years I, I, I had to wait tables or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. and it was just this idea of like, I, I think, and I think this is in all fields too. I don't think it's just music, but I, we, we can't, we can't have these unrealistic expectations, you know, like if you haven't been discovered yet. And you're not already at Carnegie Hall. What's what? Why why would you think that next week you would be? You know what I mean? Like it's you mm -hmm. have to work and and build towards something, and not only that, you want to work towards something that's sustainable as well. And and I I think that uh, I think that there are opportunities out there. You have to be uh, willing to sacrifice for it and and work for it. But but there are lots of opportunities out there. So. I personally have found that when I was earlier in my career as a musician, I felt like I kept running into all of these, uh, many musicians who felt very jaded mm -hmm. and that felt very negative about the opportunities that were there. Mm -hmm. And I found that as soon as I started thinking from an abundance perspective of, mm -hmm. well, there's work here now. And now I know that if I don't have, you know, I know that, I'm going to find a job doing this, this, and this. Yeah. Then it, it came and I stopped yep. being surrounded by musicians who couldn't find work and who couldn't, you know, find a job. And I started being surrounded by people who were doing it. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's very refreshing to have that um, <laughs> reinforced, I think, mm -hmm. um, because I, again, I think it's a life thing. I don't think it applies mm -hmm. just to music. I think that when you believe that there is abundance, abundance comes to you. And when, when you believe there's scarcity, that is what you find. So I, I, I think I was really fortunate to have teachers that definitely live in that kind of realm of like, I mean, why, like, you know, I, I, I'd, sometimes I would be like, well, why, what's the point? Why are we doing this? And they'd be like, why, why not? Like, <laughs> why, <laughs> why wouldn't you do this? Like, this is such a great opportunity. You know, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's that yeah. kind of thing. And, and, you know, you can, you can, you can always add to something. Uh, or take away from it. And I think those are active choices that we make. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I kind of want to take a little break because I have more uh, mm -hmm. questions about jazz, but I think this would be a really great time to ask you some professor questions Okay. Um, to kind of give us a little shift. Um, you've been a professor at 
BYU Idaho, you said since 2008, is that right? I started no. in January of 2008. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you've seen auditions for over a decade and mm -hmm. admitted people into the school. So mm -hmm. what advice would you give to a high school junior and senior about what they need to do to make themselves prepared to come and audition for sure. a college or university? Sure. I, I think the first thing you want to do uh, depending on you know what your what your goals are and where you like select your university if you're a musician the most you get out of the school is going to be with that private teacher <clears throat> so you start there so for example I was um, a bassist and I didn't do this. I went to CSI. There was no bass teacher there. I actually was, <laughs> I was the bass teacher while I was a yeah. Oh so it's not that's yeah. you know that's that wasn't a great choice that way. Now there were other things I learned, and that was fine. And I, it took me a while, but no, you've you've got to find where that is. And I and I think as a as a young student, you you kind of need to make a list of okay, here is my dream school and my dream teacher that I want to be with, right? And here is one that I know I could totally get into and I could go to. And mm. then there's a middle ground of like, these are my hopes and dreams. These are the ones I want to go to. So, but how do you win that audition? You start by contacting the teacher. You need to make, you need to make contact with that teacher. If you know you want to go study with somebody, go take lessons with them before. You mean they'll, they'll take a lesson with me? <laughs> yeah. they would they would love to study with you um no but the uh the uh with 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 young students it's like if you the earlier you're on their radar the better your chances are mm -hmm. and, it, and it just depends again on the on the school there are some schools that like they are really competing to get really great pianists and there's some schools that are really dying hard to get really great violinists and or really good violists or you know it, it it always depends on the instrument and the place you're going but that's why i say like if you've got to find a teacher that's going to be a good match for you because even if you win that audition and you get in if it's not a good match you know mm -hmm. you could be better served somewhere else and so uh the way the way i look at it um i've had I've had students study with me that didn't come here and students that studied with me that did, did decide to come to BYU-Idaho. And, and, and the thing is, is like the audition itself, you, you find out about those auditions and those opportunities by having contact with that professor. Mm -hmm. Do um, you, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, were you finished? Well, I'll, I'll, I, the last thing I was going to say is then just make sure that you find out early and then work to make sure that your stuff is very polished. Like give them the best your your best performance you know so but that's, that's um all. for you as a professor does it only matter how the student plays or do you look at other things that are not musical no this is actually where a lesson actually tells me more about a student than a than huh. a, a performance interesting so it's important to be like a nice human too <laughs> and it, I mean, that's that's not necessarily what I was referring to. I know. I, I, think, I, think, I think what I was trying to say is that when you have a lesson with somebody, you see how they respond to guidance, and you mm -hmm. see how they you you see how the relationship would be. Um, I've had lessons with students where I'm like, I think you'd be better served with somebody else, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. and, and that doesn't mean that they're not going to be successful. Um, right. That that means that that they could find a better match. Um, so we have, you know, and that's why I say like find somebody that you you look up to as a musician, and then go get a lesson with them. Mm -hmm. You start there, um, and that that really is that's that's my recommendation for for undergraduate for graduate degrees. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's that's got to happen. So I think that's really really useful advice. Um, I know when I was obviously as your teacher, I mean a professor, but. When I was studying in my undergrad, I had a colleague who really, really, really wanted to study with the professor at USC. Mm -hmm. And she ended up being able to go and study with this, this professor at a summer camp. And it was the worst experience of her life, mm -hmm. literally the worst experience because it was a terrible fit, but she wouldn't have known that if she didn't go do it. And then she would have yeah. been in a four year yeah. degree. So well, and that's that's the other thing is take advantage of those summer festivals and summer workshops and those type of things. And that's where like knowing if you don't have a private instructor, it's hard to be aware of those things. But there are 
even in this area, there's there's a lot of opportunities that way. So um, take advantage of, of any of those opportunities for you. The thing that I, I think out west we don't always see, <laughs> having <laughs> when I when I lived in Chicago, I was like, oh my gosh, this is just what people do. Yep. Like mm-hmm. if you're going into music. Well, then you're going to go to Aspen or Telluride or you're going to go to uh, Blue mm-hmm. Lakes or you're going to go to, I mean, like you're going to go to anything that you can go to and as many as you can. And and not to say that, you know, oh, well, then it's only open to a privileged few who can afford to do that. That's not what I'm saying. There at all of these at all of these, uh, there's typically scholarship programs where they will do what they can to help anybody mm-hmm. who wants to go. So um I think it's really important interlock you know i mean like there's so many out there that that you gotta like and 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 then you're flexing the muscle of auditions for those already so that when you do your when you do your college audition it's not the first time you go oh i have to play in front of somebody who yeah it's not your first rodeo (laughs) who's gonna judge me i mean i yeah i'm not uh here's here's the other thing for anybody who is about to do a college audition (laughs) we are um Everybody, every time I've sat on an audition, uh, uh, like performance thing or whatever, whether it be for that or for juries or whatever, like everyone in the room is going, I really hope they just play great. <laughs> like every time, it's not, this isn't American Idol. There's no Simon Cowell on there. Like, <laughs> you know, everybody up there is going, oh, I, I really want to hear them at their best. Mm. You know, so, so if that, you know, next time you or, whoever's listening to this goes out and has to do an audition just remember like they want you to succeed just as much if not more than you do Mm. and and let that kind of let that kind of you know settle in enough to go oh yeah this is a safe place i need to just be me and just play yeah that's really great yeah i think a lot of times in at least in classical music we always feel like there's this level of perfection and nothing else is acceptable Mm-hmm. And, but, but also because we're always aiming for that, we uh, always look for the mistakes. And so it's hard to imagine that people that are going to be our mentors are really hoping that, you know, that we, we do our best instead of are waiting for us to make a mistake. But the reality is that, like you said, they, they, you really want to hear the people well, that audition at their best. Not only yeah. that, not only that, especially in college, um, you're you're actually partly you're a student, but you're also making this transition to being a peer. Right. And and it, it will happen, especially when you're in graduate school and, and and beyond. But like when you're in your undergraduate, like your teachers are going, oh, these are going to be my peers that I work with in the next five ten years, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's not really in their interest to just destroy you and be like. <laughs> Yeah. yeah but i do want to talk um you you brought this up yes, and maybe yes. maybe we can move to this yeah. or pivot to this um where you had talked about classical musicians and 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 first of all let me just, <laughs> let me just start let me just start with this i don't consider myself a classical musician or a jazz musician i consider myself a musician uh-huh. okay and and i i don't know how clear it is in my background i mean i've I have uh, done the debut performance of a bass concerto in Ecuador with their National Symphony. I've played as a bassist in um, in a handful of different symphony orchestras as the principal bassist. I've you know I've played in musicals and I've played in operas and I've played in all these different you know opportunities. For me, I'm just like I just want to play music. So I'm not <laughs> like right. like uh-huh. I, I don't really love this distinction of oh well you're a jazz player let's let's talk about that or you're a classical player let's talk about that so um let's just talk about practicing for just a minute mm-hmm. okay and and angela brought up this idea of oh there's a perfect performance okay <laughs> <laughs> um when i did my master's degree i was really fortunate for my master's thesis to reach out to my greatest hero on the on the double bass, uh, his name is Gary Peacock, and unfortunately he just passed away about a month month and a half ago, ago mm. and he just he just passed. But um, I loved his I loved his playing, I loved his his demeanor, I loved the the way he would play the bass, and and in in a course of interviews and things like that, I I did a, a thesis that just looked at his style and and how he played the bass and how he approached that. 
And we talked about a couple of things, but one of the things we talked about was this idea that he really he really subscribes to or tried to live his life in this way, which is this. Um, he 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 was very heavily influenced by Zen Buddhism, and mm-hmm. I have to admit that I have not. Apart from when I did my master's thesis and and to be able to like understand what he was talking about, I'm not a practitioner of this. Okay, so I'm not saying. I am a master of this, and and you should do it too. But there's some really important things I think that that we kind of came to with it. And and uh, one time we were talking about this idea of the expert's mind versus the beginner's mind. Mm. Well, an expert's mind, too often we run into, and it's not just in classical music. Okay, <laughs> it's not. Mm-hmm. It's but there is this idea when you're doing a task. If you have in your mind that it is there is one correct way to do it, as <laughs> Gary Peacock said, it's over for you. Because mm-hmm. you've given yourself one path to success. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. That's, if, that's brilliant. Yeah. If, if you if you if you look at it from a beginner's mind, guess what? <laughs> you don't have that perfect performance. It's like every time I do this, it's new and it's fresh and it's it's the best I can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? So so this idea, this concept of a beginner's mind versus an expert's mind, um, and not necessarily versus, but, you know, which one do you want to ascribe to? This actually is, for me, uh, I, I do a presentation on the improviser's mindset and how you can use that in performance and practice. And notice I didn't say jazz improviser or right. classical improviser. It's just as a musician. Yeah. So... So the big thing is, you know, when you get in the practice room, what is it that you do? What is your what does your practice session look like? For many of us, it's like, well, my teacher said I do this and I do this and I do this and I do this. <laughs> and when I don't do it this way, they get mad at me. And when I do it this way, you know, that type of thing. Like that that type of practice, we're we're kind of we're seeking after external validation of what we're trying to do. Right. And whether whether the teacher knows it or not, um, the end goal is for you to be the one that goes, that's what I was trying to do. That's it. That's that's the sound I wanted to make. Or, ooh, I just discovered something new, right? Like so, um, for me, practice is always an opportunity to discover something about yourself, physically, yourself emotionally through like musical phrasing and shaping and those type of things. And something about your instrument too. Mm. You can let your instrument be a teacher. And if you can focus on those three things in practice, then your practice can start to be guided by where you are as opposed to always waiting for somebody to say, hey, you know what you need to do next? You need to do X, Y, Z. Here we go. Uh, Oh, Andrew, you've been playing really well now. We're going to make sure that you start doing these hand crossing exercises. Well, yeah, of course. It's like, mm-hmm. I get it. The repertoire has been around for hundreds of years, and we know how to get good at that repertoire. Right. But how do you get good at being you mm. with an instrument? Right? Yeah. yeah. How, do you focus, how do you focus on that? So, so for me, I'm, I'm looking for opportunities when I practice of either letting the bass teach me something let my body teach me something physically where I'm like, oh, I feel tension when I do this. Or I feel that doesn't feel right. There's something wrong there. And I have to slow it down and, and that type of thing. Um, but I'm always approaching it from an improviser's mindset in that I am open to suggestion. I'm open to pivoting. I'm opening to changing. Uh, there was a great cellist that came through here a couple of years back who was talking about practicing Bach. And, and he was playing like the Bach cello suites, which of course, I mean, good grief. Every cellist has to play those. But by the way, every violist has to play those. And every, <laughs> every, every bassist gets, gets to play those as well. And, so, um, and not only that, we get to play them at pitch. So when I play the cello suite, the Bach wow. cello suite, I play it in the same octave as the cello. But Some it's, it's for way, days. way, way more, <laughs> it's substantially more, more virtuosic a piece, yeah. a piece for us. So <laughs> as, as you're working through uh, these, though, this cellist said, hey, what do you do when you mess up? <laughs> and, you know, how many times have we seen somebody play a Bach piece or whatever, and they, they mess up, 
Yeah. Stop. Lose your place in the memory. The time yeah. stops, uh, and they go back, and they reset, and they go, right? Uh, yeah. And, and, and he said something really curious. He says, well, next time that happens, if you have a memory slip, why don't you just keep playing and see what happens? Right? <laughs> because guess what? When you're performing, okay, 90% yeah. of your audience is not going to know what you're doing, mm -hmm. and that's okay. There's going to be an educated few that go, oh, Oh, Interesting. They're, they're <laughs> that's not the Bach cello suite I remember, but that's okay because in the end, you know, is a is is a perfect performance one that's exactly right off the page, or is a mm. perfect performance something that touches the listener and moves the audience in in a in maybe a, an emotional or cathar cathartic way where they they come out better people because they were able to enjoy what you gave them you know right. so in in your in your performance in your practice you want to be looking for ways that you can stretch your mind a little bit on and expand your understanding of like what's possible with the instrument expand your understanding of what's possible for you to physically do like be able to go oh i i had a teacher one time that told me i shouldn't make this hand shape but I can make it and look what happens. Oh, I can, I, this might be useful somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. it's not, maybe it's not. But, you know, I, of course, when you're younger, you're trying to figure out that technique and all those things. And there's ways, there's ways to, to do that. I'm not, I'm not saying that if you just picked up the, you know, the, the cello or the violin or something, that you should totally just go off on your own. As a, as a student who did not have a teacher, I was always looking for guidance. Right. And I was looking for it in everything I did. But I also had to flex the muscle of, okay, how am I going to learn this? And I did that, you know, at a young age on the electric bass. I was like, well, my mom makes people play scales. I'll play scales. So <laughs> in, one, in one summer, I played yeah. all my major and minor scales. I played all the intervals. I memorized the fingerboard in three months. And wow. then it never was a problem for me. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I didn't realize what a gift that was. Until mm -hmm. much later, when I started teaching students, I was like, "Wait, you don't? You, you, <laughs> you don't didn't do this one summer?" <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and that's and 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 you know, and that was just that was really a blessing for me to have been so interested yeah. in figuring it out that I was like, "No, I got to do this. I got to mm -hmm. do this." You know. So, um, but yeah, I, I would I would challenge next time you go into the practice room, of course, be be focused on what it is you're trying to do. But be open to suggestion. As you play something, is the music telling you something? Is the instrument telling you something? Is your body telling you something? Right? So is there something there that you're just trying to muscle through? Or are you trying to be open to suggestion and go, oh, there might be a different path here? Mm -hmm. You know? Okay, so I have to ask a follow-up question from a teacher's perspective. Because I know... Um, I would say that for myself as a teacher, I have more strengths in helping people get better technically at an instrument. And sure. when I have junior high students who come to me and are just doing everything right, but are completely detached from their instruments, um, it's really hard for me to get them to open up. And we'll talk about paintings and we'll talk about colors and we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll write a story to it. We'll do lots of things. Sure. But sometimes it still doesn't work. So mm -hmm. how do you how do you get students to take this explore? I mean, you've explained it about being a beginner and exploring, but as a, a instead of as a student, but as a teacher, how do you how do you instill that? You have to find a way to help them take a chance in a space that feels safe. Mm. Mm. So you have to find a way where they can express or do something, and 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 the way I do it is by doing something totally crazy and weird which you know they're never going to do right they're on your like, instrument sure okay. absolutely yeah <laughs> so um you know i was working one time with a clarinetist that was playing the clarinet part the first clarinet part to candide and there's a part in the very end that's very like difficult because it goes over the break or something like that i mean i i'm not a clarinetist i don't know all the technical stuff that was going on and i didn't care okay mm. 
but it had this like this gesture was like blah 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 like there, it was just like this this gesture was like blah, 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 blah. you know like it, it went super fast and i was like and he was tripping all over it like just like i don't know what was going on i was like man that's i said is that the hardest part for you yes it's the hard okay what makes it hard well there's just so many notes and it's so fast and i said okay let's step back i said what's the gesture there what's going on and i i and he said oh it's this or that and i said but i said is it important like is it important or or if there's a character i mean you you talked about telling the story but but do you ever do you ever take music and kind of like make fun of it <laughs> like honestly like do you ever go right. Hey guys, this isn't that serious of a thing, by the way. Right. You know, like it is just music at the end of the day. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and so uh, <laughs> I know this is gonna hurt some of your listeners who, who feel like <laughs> it's everything. And and I'm not saying that that's not true. I'm also saying that sometimes we take ourselves so seriously. Yeah. We set up all these boundaries and walls where we could just be like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know so i said okay i said when you get to that one it's like <laughs> like <laughs> like it's gonna be like like you're making this gesture of like Ugh, like you're you, you know i spit on you like that kind of thing <laughs> whatever i don't know next time he played it went right through it. it was no it was like no wow. big deal and i was like yeah whoa because that gesture there you're making it too big of a deal when the mm -hmm. composer didn't Right. Uh, and, and so what happens then is you go, you look at it and you're thinking all of the technical things that must happen to make this work. Right. right. Uh -huh. And it's like, but does it need to happen? Like, <laughs> does it need to happen? What's the gesture? Well, the gesture is nyet, nyet, nyet. Like, okay, well then just go nyet, nyet, nyet when you get there. <laughs> and, and he did. So... And it was like, all of a sudden it was like, oh, the, the weight and the importance I'm putting on this little part is actually making me tense up. Right. And it's actually keeping me from doing what I can do. Mm -hmm. So it, it's looking for opportunities to unlock that. And I think oftentimes you have to do something that is totally out of left field or totally unexpected with the music. And so I really will work with students on doing things in the extreme. Mm. And this, uh, this is a, a, a bit of a side note. I think of this technically as well. So technique for me, uh, I kind of answered this on your scale question. I'm so sorry. I probably didn't. You can cut this if you want to put it in. <laughs> the, the, thing with, the thing with scales and stuff like that, it's like, it's like sometimes in my mind, sometimes it's like CrossFit. It's like, look, the hardest thing I have to do, I do not want it to be on a solo piece that I'm playing. The hardest thing right. that I have to ever play should never be the thing I'm performing. Mm. Period. Hmm. So if, if, if I'm always stretching and doing things that are beyond what I'm going to have to actually do in the moment, guess what? In the moment, that's the easiest thing I've done all day, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's a, shift. it's a shift of like, well, it wasn't as hard as what I had to work on earlier today. And, and, and that kind of gives you this confidence in a performance where you're like, I got this. I've done mm -hmm. way more difficult things than this. And yeah. then you can mm -hmm. relax into it and just focus on the, on the music. Um, but I would, I would take that idea of the perfect performance and I would burn it. <laughs> just get, I like that. Get, I, get it out of your, get it out of your mind, get it out of your, your vocabulary a, because becomes... a perfect performance is you, <laughs> you being, right. you being honest with what it is you can do in the moment huh. and, and being able to do that. Yeah. I mean, if we take the humanity out of, live performance and what's the point of listening to a live performance instead of a CD. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Um, one thing that was kind of coming to my mind as you were talking about this idea of, you know, not having the perfect performance, not being the, cause there's only one option. Um, mm -hmm. Michael Phelps, you know, mm -hmm. one of the greatest swimmers of all time or arguably the greatest, <laughs> what, one of the things that he would do is he, at night he would go through his race in yeah. every possible scenario. So he went through the race when his goggles fell off. He went through the race when his suit split. He went through the race when, you know, he yeah. went through all these and he actually set a world record without goggles once in the, in the fly. So it's, it kind of reminded me of that because- um, You have to, you have to challenge yourself to be able to be in that mindset of like, first of all, what's the worst thing that's gonna happen? do you know what i mean like right what is the worst thing what's the worst thing that could happen for him oh he loses the race 
Like, I mean, <laughs> honestly, it's, right. there's nothing, there's nothing that would happen. Well, I mean, honestly, there, there's, there's not that, it's not that big a deal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and sometimes we, we, we take things and we make them so important that they almost become like these sacred cows that we can't <laughs> do anything with and we can never live up to the expectation that we've created. Huh. Um, but, but I think it's, it's way more important that we, we remember like, why did you start playing music? Like for me, I was so curious and I, I just loved the sound of the bass. I loved how it like moved your whole body. <laughs> so it's like every time I play, like that still makes me smile. Like the, the, the fact that like I can play a low note, I'm like, yep. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's still there. It, is. You know? <laughs> it, it still gets me excited. So I I think you know as a student, like look at look at what the technique is for. I think this is what going to that question earlier where I talked about using a journal to kind mm -hmm. of keep track of things because like you know if if Michael Phelps, going on your swimming analogy, uh, never kept track of what his times were. <laughs> How, you know, like I, huh. I, he's, he's keeping track and going, oh yeah, today I was slower, but you know what? I ate such and such last night and I felt heavy or I felt like I was sluggish, right? Huh. Like yep. just, just, just the act of, of putting it out there that you're going to say, I'm going to be honest with what just happened in the practice room mm -hmm. and not wait until I get to my weekly lesson where my teacher goes, what did you work on this week? <laughs> I mean, I've never had that before. <laughs> I think that there, there has been a common theme that I'm getting from every person that we've spoken to so far, where as a musician, there's so many more things built into being successful that you have to do for yourself that just come naturally in other fields. For example, if you're a swimmer, you go to swim meets. And so mm -hmm. when you swim that 50 free, it is timed by someone else and it is put down and you can go and look it up at sure. any USA swimming website, sure. right? So there's always these things written down. And even if you don't keep a journal of every single day of what you're doing, you can tell, oh, last year at nationals, I did this. And this year at nationals, yeah. I've done this. And there's always a way to do that. And in music, it's not there. Well, I, right? would, I would encourage, I would I'd push back a little bit. I would encourage when you play a recital that you keep that recording. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how many, how many students do you know refuse to go back and listen to the recording? That's fine. Because they're yeah. so embarrassed. Don't worry about it. No, don't worry about it. Don't worry uh -huh. about it. Oh, but okay. when, you get, when you get two, three years down the road, look back at it. Right. You know, one thing I'm definitely guilty of is I get embarrassed. And so I just don't want those feelings from that <laughs> recital yeah. back and so i don't even care if it's deleted Traumatizing. i don't even care if it's in the in the digital trash bin just it's okay. because it's just I, like i i mean yeah. I, I i get where, what you're saying i i think here's here's the important part of it i've i've had students to know and uh when they come to a lesson with me uh we record every lesson really okay Absolutely. I record wow. every lesson. Yep. We I've, record every I've lesson. I've never recorded you need to their, record your lessons. Okay. But part of their part of their <laughs> from now on. <laughs> part of their practice the first day uh, or the day of the lesson is they go and they take notes. So I don't I don't write down in a journal for them or I don't write down mm -hmm. in a notebook for them what their assignment is. I expect them to go back and listen to the recording. Because the thing is they're gonna see usually and, and I intentionally do this, like where they're working on some technique, right? And once we catch it, I said, perfect, go back and watch this part again. Like, this is what you're going to, wow. this is what you're going to focus on. <clears throat> like what you just did is exactly what you need to be focusing on when you practice mm -hmm. this or whatever. Um, but, but the other thing is I've had students as they're getting close to juries, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, and they're like, oh, I just, I'm just not getting any better. I said, here, let's pull up your, let's pull up your first lesson. Listen to the sound you just made and listen to what, what you used to make. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they go, oh. Like, I didn't realize that I'd gotten better, huh. right? Yeah. But it's that same idea of like, well, because the thing is, you study with a teacher, guess what? They're not going to be like, hey, that, well, sorry. A good teacher is not going to be like, man, that sounds great. <laughs> and they shouldn't be. What? They're doing you a disservice no. if they do. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and you don't, you don't go to it. It's like if you went to a dietitian and all they ever said is, hey, you know what? Like, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to, you don't need to do this. You know, that's fine. And, and I'm not saying that we have to totally change ourselves. I think there is actually this this part of like being very accepting of who we are, and then and then moving forward with that, 
as opposed to having this idea of, well, this is the perfect bassist or this is the perfect musician. And if I'm not that, then I'm a failure. And that's not, that's not at all what I'm saying. I'm saying you must be really honest with who you are. And I think that's what the journal, the journaling mm -hmm. aspect is. And the other thing is getting comfortable with watching yourself in those awkward moments. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Because the thing is, is like you're, you're practicing flexing that muscle of like when it feels embarrassing or feels things that you don't get flooded and shut down. Mm -hmm. Because you don't, you, you, you know, I, I used to do that. I'd get so nervous on things and I finally, and we're talking during my doctorate. I'm not talking right. like when I was in high school I'm <laughs> yeah. in my doctorate. Cause I come in and I'm like, I don't have a lot of background. I don't have a lot of training with the bow. And I was just embarrassed by the sound I made. And I've got these freshmen and juniors that are like nailing the excerpts and cranking them out. And I'm like, I don't know. What am I doing here? You know? Uh -huh. So, but you know, Every, every time I talk with my teacher, he's like, trust your preparation. That's all you can do. He's like, you don't have to, you don't have to be them. Just be you and trust your preparation. Hmm. And, and that's, a, that's a really important thing to lean into. If you feel like you've worked really hard and you've, and, and you've been honest with yourself in those practice sessions and focused on the things that you need to, then you just got to lean into it. And, and, uh, and the other thing is that like, what if the performance goes totally awful? <laughs> well, this, this is what I say is like, okay, if I'm in, if I'm under pressure and I play something and there's parts that just totally fail, that's where I got to practice. That's all it is. That's all it's telling me. It's like, it's not the end of the world. I mean, it's the same thing. Right. If like a, 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 a boxer gets in the ring and everything's working and then all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, they always cut me with this move. Well, guess what? That's what you got to work on. Like that's all it mm -hmm. is. It's just it's it's being honest with with yourself and and with what you can do and then what areas you need to focus on. So I I remember dating a guy and I was complaining. This is while I was doing my this doctorate. A different show now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you brought this up last interview too. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, yeah, totally different thing. Um, same right. guy though. Um, so we all we all do therapy in well, different ways. Not so the same thing, but it, an experience talk. about someone you were dating. <laughs> so I was complaining about a technique that I wasn't oh, okay. doing well because I I was just like, oh, I'm just really bad at this part. He's like. Oh, so you're just gonna, that's what you're gonna be practicing then. And I, I, I remember looking at him going, why would I do that? <laughs> like, well, why would I practice something this hard? And, yeah. and he was just kind of, like, he was, he's a computer he's programmer. Like, why wouldn't you? Yeah. He's like, why don't you fix it? Yeah, fix the yeah. bugs. Like, that's yeah. what he did. If there's a problem, he fixes it. And, and I, like, I remember from that point on, it totally changed the way that I framed mistakes and things yep. that were hard. Yep. I, I stopped playing the easy stuff and I was like, why wouldn't I fix it? It's not fun to get in a performance and know that I'm not good at this part and know it's not going to go well. So well, why wouldn't I go back and fix it? Along those lines, I would be really careful when you're working out those parts that are hard and difficult, you slow it way down mm -hmm. and get really honest with yourself. Like, am I doing the movement in a way that's natural and that feels, right. and I'm talking about playing the bass, but I think this is on all instruments that absolutely we physically is yeah. where if, if i'm introducing tension then stop and this is actually why when we talked earlier this whole idea of drilling 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 i hate it really I hate it huh. yes and here's why because if a student drills something and they're drilling it incorrectly they have just spent an entire week creating muscle memory of how to play something wrong yeah. huh. okay so there's there's i think there's a need for more guidance when somebody's younger on something mm -hmm. but as you as you develop and you get better at things and you're learning new techniques you have to be really open to this idea of okay i have to we we, we just talked about it right when you every time you practice it's an opportunity to discover you something about you physically something about your instrument physically or what the instrument how the instrument creates sound or whatever it is and then something about the music and and in those three areas, if, if you're not discovering one of those things, then you're, you're falling into that spiral of, oh, I'm going to just fix this, right? <laughs> I'm going to just play it right. I'm going to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think, uh, I think there's, there's a better way. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is that if you slow it down, do it right, then walk away for a minute 
Okay, because what you're trying to do is get your body to do what you want it to do, not what you've done a thousand times over and over again. Yeah. But you want you want that body to be so relaxed that if you get this feeling of, oh my gosh, this Bach thing just went off the rails. Okay, well, I just do this. And we, <laughs> we'll come back and it'll be fine. You know, we recover. We recover. Same thing. Right. It's like, you know, Michael Phelps, his goggles came off. What do you do? Just keep swimming. Like, I mean, it's like, come on, you know. You know, it's not, yeah. right? Because in that, that in that, go that ahead. That seems Andy. so weird like in in swimming you just keep swimming but right. for in music it's kind of just like oh like like yeah. what do you, i mean moment. well you stay so in the moment, interesting right you yeah stay in the sound yeah live, that's live interesting. in the sound or live yeah. in the music live in the live in that moment and and i think uh you know we we can we, we can become our own worst memories with the drilling thing because what mm -hmm. happens when somebody makes a mistake oh go back and do it again oh Go back and do it again. Uh, Go back and do it again. Yeah. And so you get this, you get this like negative cycle uh, mm -hmm. that that will show up in performances because instead of slowing it down and playing it right, so they could feel it from beginning to end, yeah, they're like, nope, I gotta drill, 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 drill. So what you've practiced is something you would never do in performance. Hmm. Right. Wow. Unless your performance is playing small chunks over and over and over again, <laughs> right? Minimalism. Right, yeah. So yes. I, would, I, would just, I would just say next time you, you find a spot that's troubling or, or problematic, take a moment, slow it down, find the way that your body wants to play it, and then do it once that way. And then take a minute and reflect on it. Maybe write it down in your practice journal. Hmm. And then if you want to, maybe play it a second time that practice session but move on to something else okay i think that wow for the majority of musicians at least younger ones um we really underplay how powerful the mind is in helping mm -hmm. us learn and progress yes. um and we think that if you just muscle through it and do it and do it and do it it will just magically get better and i can't tell you how many different stories and how many different disciplines not even musical ones where it's proven over and over and over that your mind has way more control than the rest of it. And so if you can get your mind in the right place by doing a practice journal or by, by thinking and reflecting, mm -hmm. you're going to get way more progress yeah. and, and you won't get injured because you're not spending all this time doing this, this thing again and repetitive exercise with your muscles and they're not meant mm -hmm. to do that or, you know, yeah, and I mean, mm. of course, your your body has to get comfortable with the moves, right? But right. I don't think that's from doing it a million times that makes you comfortable with it. What I think right. is, is you find a speed where you can do the move. Right. I mean, tension. we didn't we didn't so, learn to walk by just, drilling. <laughs> yeah, like you learn to walk by like your body just mad like makes these these changes and it's like oh well I fell when I did this so now I'm gonna do this the next time and you know if you watch a baby learn to walk and it's if we can approach learning music the same way oh it didn't work that way I fell off the fingerboard or I you know instead of bad mistakes or yeah <laughs> so anyway. uh well wow. Francois Rabat is a, a great incredible bass pedagogue and performer virtuoso incredible totally changed the whole landscape of the bass mm -hmm. um he's still alive he's he's uh i don't know if he's 90 yet but he's getting very close if he isn't wow. um and still performing and very active um but so cool. he uh he was he was a he was like a bodybuilder like <laughs> like i mean like that is amazing and so, wow and so like like some people you know they have to like meditate before a performance he would have to do push-ups like get his heart rate up, like, <laughs> oh like, be, like ready to go so, anyway but whatever that he said he said there uh one of the best things you can do is is get rid of the word difficult in your vocabulary mm. so mm -hmm. when you play an instrument what makes something difficult it's that it's unfamiliar. You haven't done yeah. it yet. Mm -hmm. But but guess what? When I meet somebody new, I'm like, oh man, you're difficult. No, <laughs> you're, you're unfamiliar. I don't know you yet. And what I'm going right. to do is I'm going to get to know you, right? Like yeah. yeah. Or or the same thing is like you know we can we can choose to put up those walls by saying it's difficult. And so then our mind says, okay, I'm going to have to work really hard. I'm going to have to do all these things, and all this stuff just like starts to just pile up. Whereas we could say. Oh, I've never done that before. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. How do I do things that I've never done before? Well, I watch other people do them. Like you use the example of somebody learning to walk. Have you ever watched how little kids who are learning to walk, watch other people <laughs> walking? It's like, it's amazing. Or if a kid's yeah. learning how to ride a bike, they watch other people mm -hmm. ride a bike, you know, with, with real intensity. Um, and there's also this element of playing with it, you know, and I think that's actually mm -hmm. like the bigger, the bigger thing is like when you, um, going back to this natural learning, uh, process, which is something that I've spent a lot of time studying as well. Um, speaking when it when when a, when a kid's learning to speak they're playing with sounds mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what they're doing they're not <laughs> sitting there going i must say dad 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 like perfectly right, right. Yeah. how many times when a when a kid like figures out the word like they'll keep using it over and over again because they like love that they're doing it right mm -hmm. yeah. but that's not them going i must repeat this a million times or i'm gonna forget it they're just super proud of themselves for like right. actually making it sound the same way yeah yeah and so like when you when you play something when you're playing music and those type of things like you 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 kind of need to get out of your own way a little bit and let your body do what it can do but also in practice find ways to let your body do what it can do and not try to force it into something that it's that, that's mm -hmm. really ab out, out of you know that's why a good teacher is important because they'll teach you the proper ways of of setup and those type of things so you don't injure yourself Right. But you also you also have to be body awareness is a huge part of, of what we do. And mm -hmm. and and I would I'll say it one more time. Do not I, the drilling thing. I, I, I don't it's I, I've I've moved on from that now. Huh. I, I, I no longer really like I I, I, I haven't seen it actually. I, I've seen it hurt too many people to feel like it's it's a good thing and I, and mm. I think there's other ways and so I would just challenge you to go so slow that you can do it without without feeling tension or without introducing poor technique into the into the system yeah. so Thank well you. I feel so inspired because I've definitely done lots of drilling and lots of <laughs> forcing myself to do things and lots of negative mental thinking about like Oh, this is difficult. So I, I need to talk to you more, Aaron. <laughs> I should next be a time, better cousin. <laughs> next time, next time you play, you you sit down at the piano and say, "How is this going to be fun this time?" Yeah, like I and, like, and, and you pick the hardest thing you're working on, and say, "How is this going to be fun this time? How can yeah. I make it fun?" Yeah, not not how can I make it a chore? Perfect. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the other thing I say with my students is, you know what is it that we're going to do? Like if you go and you're going to like do a concert or something, or you're going to go and, and what, what is it called? Oh yeah. Play. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go play my bass. I'm going to go, I'm going to go play with yeah. uh, these musicians, right? right? It's not, Hey, I'm going to go and I'm going to go drill with these musicians. I just want you guys to know <laughs> what we're going to do for the next two hours. Or uh, I'm yeah. going to go with my bass right now and I am going to, really work like it's like oh, i'm gonna go play no. my bass yeah or make them. music a creative yeah. process yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly i'm gonna go create yeah. i'm gonna go yep. play mm -hmm. uh there's a there's a word that i want you to go look up and this i i do a whole presentation on this uh we talked about the improviser mindset um but andrew go check out go look up the word leela it's a sanskrit okay. word okay i'm not gonna tell like l-e-l-a it's l-i-l-a okay okay and like in another, the dictionary well, it's a Sanskrit word, so, so Google, you'll probably. probably have to use Google. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then there's a there's another book that I would recommend for all your listeners, and it's actually written by a violist, um, but the name of the book is Free Play. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the things that I've talked about today, he, he hits some of them. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, again, I'm pulling a lot from the interviews and stuff I did with Gary Peacock, and then also just my own mis misinformation that i keep so, anyway. but yeah well, i just i would say just play like but but yeah. look up leela look up leela and will. see if that's I something will. you can you can use in your in your practice so yes i will is there yeah. i anything else that you think you would like to add to tell our listeners that they can add to their toolbox i would say you know that going back to this journal idea Mm -hmm. I would say at at least 
at, and and again, you you have to be honest with yourself, but you should also be positive and kind mm -hmm. to yourself, um, because like you know, if I, I would just say when if you start doing this, just do it once. Just write down how your practice session went, and and on, be honest with yourself and say, yeah, this was still a struggle. I'm gonna need more help with this because it starts to shift from being like I'm bad at playing this to being mm -hmm. I need help. And, right. and so then you're going to be open to what your teacher's telling you or maybe watching other people play and go, oh, what did they do there? Like, oh, could I do that? Maybe. Yeah, maybe mm -hmm. I should try that, you know. Mm -hmm. So and, and the other thing is just always be curious. So like we said with practicing, you know, I, I gave three areas that for me, it's like it's always a time of discovery, whether it be physical discovery, whether it be instrumental discovery of like what your instrument actually does. So my physical body my interaction with the instrument and how it creates sound and then musical so look for ways that you can just be a bit more creative in your process and not always waiting for external validation on your mm. music making so that is so great i feel like in my practice sessions i'm always the reason why i've never done a journal is because i'm always been like oh well i don't need it that would just take time away from practicing i just need to why why would i take time doing Useful that time yeah yeah so i'll definitely do that too cool okay thank well, you so much yes thank you for yeah, making you time for this today is there for is there any place you would like our listeners to find you at or <laughs> no <laughs> okay <laughs> don't find yeah. me don't look for me <laughs> how can no, they um... find you <laughs> More like your questions. house address or <laughs> yeah, right it's my mother's maiden name um, <laughs> your office in your uh, the college <laughs> no i i'm always open uh my my email is millerAA at byui.edu and if anybody has questions from today and they would like me to further elaborate on it i'd be happy to okay. um i uh i do play with um Kobe Watkins, who is the last drummer to work steadily with uh, Sonny Rollins. And those of you that know jazz, those would be names you recognize. And if you don't, that's OK. Too. Uh, but we put an album out two years ago. You can find it on iTunes. It's mm. called the Kobe Watkins Group Tet. And the name of the album is Movement. So check it out. I think you'll, you'll like it. Um, Great. So I'm on that one. And then yeah, I think there's actually a, if you wanted to see me play and go, should I even listen to this guy at all? Uh, there's also, uh, there is a video of me playing with, uh, with the Ecuador, um, uh, the, the, what was it, the uh, Symphony de Guayaquil, um, mm -hmm. and I play the, the Glissich Concerto. If you can't find it, again, just do a search for Aaron Miller Glissich bass concerto i think you'll find it and if you put ecuador in there it'll be easy too so mm -hmm. those are those are some if you wanted to hear me play and uh i'm always open to to working with people and answering questions for students and things like that so mm -hmm. awesome thank you so much yes thanks yeah. again we appreciate it for listening guys we hope you enjoyed that episode uh we're fairly new so we'd appreciate it if you shared it with all of your friends and you can find us on all the podcasting platforms you listen to and we're also on youtube so thanks for watching is there an episode that you would like us to cover or a topic that we haven't yet if you have one feel free to contact us through our website which is the musicians toolbox podcast.com or you can email us at the musicians podcast the musicians toolbox <laughs> podcast at gmail.com yeah and we also for those of you who are watching our youtube channel know but we've got some amazing merch that we're not wearing right now but it looks really sick so we recommend you check that out and support us that really helps us appreciate you checking that out on our website um and also anywhere else find links you could probably find a picture or two of it also on our social media accounts oh, um, yeah. and you can also find information about the next person that we're going to be presenting to you so yeah. we are on instagram and facebook, facebook and you can find us at the musicians toolbox perfect thanks for listening see you later bye